In Christ alone will I glory, though I could pride myself in battles won. For I've been blessed beyond measure, and by His strength alone I've overcome. Oh, I can stop and count successes like diamonds in my hand. But those trophies could not equal to the grace by which I stand. In Christ alone I place my trust and find my glory in the power of the cross. In every victory, let it be said of me, my source of strength, my source of hope is Christ alone. In Christ alone will I glory. For only by His grace I am redeemed. And only His tender mercies could reach beyond my weakness to my needs. Now I seek no greater honor than just to know Him more and to count my gains but losses to the glory of my Lord. In Christ alone I place my trust and find my glory in the power of the cross. In every victory let it be said of me, my source of strength, my source of hope is Christ alone. I place my trust and find my glory in the power of the cross in every victory. Let it be said of me, my source of strength, my source of hope is Christ alone. My source of strength, my source of hope is Christ alone only Christ not of me not of you only Jesus Christ only Jesus Christ all right we're going to take up the Lord's offering if brother Chris can come forward and take up the Lord's offering for us over there then also he can ask God's blessing upon the church service with the word of prayer for us Father, we are very grateful for the blessing of the Lord. the blessing of our own church that we can have just a better vibe, a, a larger spirit. We can bring people in here and Amen. let them see that we are a legitimate place. You know, just by That's people. right. Sometimes the word is not enough to convince people. They go by sight. Unfortunately, by yeah. We just appreciate you helping us along the way to get people to realize that we are here in the Amen. Earth. That's right. We just welcome them. Father, I ask that you <clears throat> bless this offering. Uh, we know it's going to good good things. Pastor always lets us know that we're helping out many, many people through these tithings. And we want people to know that it's not the tithings that save them. And if they they, they don't want to give the tithing, they don't have to. It's all from the heart. Mm -hmm. they give it, just give it. If you don't, you don't. It's not a priority or an obligation. Father, uh, help us help us understand the message today that Pastor's going to give us. 
I was like the same. Uh, our evil thoughts come with us deep in the years. Amen. And Father, let us not be prideful of our salvation. Let us discern yes, Amen. and joy. I think some of us might feel like we're better than others just because we know we're saved. And uh -huh. we, don't want, we want to feel happy. We don't want to feel prideful. We're all That's saved. right. And, uh, we just, it's all, I pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 We're going to look at the Ephesians, please, the book of Ephesians. Please open up your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, chapter 4. We're going to look at Ephesians, chapter 4. So, actually today, the Lord led upon my heart not to, uh, to preach without notes, to preach without notes today. So I'm going to see how the Holy Spirit leads upon my heart. The Lord led upon my heart to preach a particular sermon where we start a Bible-believing church together in a new location. Let's start off with Ephesians chapter 4. We will read verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. The Apostle Paul, he is writing to the church of Ephesus. And to the church of Ephesus, he is writing to them about endeavoring to unify, endeavoring to keep the church going. He's trying to rally them up. As a matter of fact, you can see that the fruits of this church at Ephesus is apparent at Revelation chapter 2. In Revelation chapter 2, Jesus Christ told the church at Ephesus that they were zealous and that he was proud of them. However, they forgot the first works, and Jesus Christ told them that they ought to repent. But out of most of the churches you see at Revelation, Ephesus was one of the best churches. So the church at Ephesus, it had a great zeal to serve God. And Paul the Apostle, that's why he wrote this passage. He wrote this passage, passage to ignite the zeal, to ignite the flame where they have a desire of, I want to have a Bible-believing church. I want to come to a Bible-believing church. I want to make a Bible-believing church great that can shake up the area in this community. I want to create a church where all people can come over and we can build up even more and more, affect people around the community and even around the world. And you know what? As we start this new church, we got to see, we got to see that motivation, that fire. There are people trying to help out in playing the piano, in song leading, in doing the announcements, in taking care of the nursery. Just by your attendance, just by you visiting today, you're contributing, you're helping out the church. And that's what I want to ignite within all of you. Let's ignite within ourselves a desire where we want to make this the best church ever. Let's ignite within all of us a desire where we want to serve God and give Him the glory. That we have been to too many churches. You have been to many churches before in your lives where pastors are not standing for the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Where people are pulling compromises. When you go to church, people expect something to please their flesh. Some kind of entertainment. Some kind of gig from the pastor rather than the preaching of the Word of God. Rather than what can I do to serve my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What can I do to please Him even better. There are churches who don't even soul win. There are churches, can I repeat that? There are churches who don't even soul win. And we need that desire within ourselves. We want to make a church that can reach every soul around the world and win them to Jesus Christ. We want to be a church that can help people in the community and show them that there are Christians who truly love them, care for their souls, and want nothing but the best in their lives. Amen. More importantly than that, a God who loves them even more and want the betterment for their lives. 
we, let's create that kind of a church. And I told you before, when I was rotten in a room and Brother Chuck was there at the beginning, when there were only two people in a room or one person in the room, I don't care if it's one or we fill up 50 to 100 to 1,000. I will still stay right here if God calls me to. Do the soul winning. Do the preaching. Do the nursery work. Do the song leading. Do anything that I can in my power to, to be a Bible-believing church, to stand for the truth, to reach souls, to show them the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and get them prepared for the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. I will do it alone if I have to. I don't care about that. I want to serve my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I want to incite within all of you a passion, a passion that I want to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to get involved in a church that loves Jesus. And I mean really loves Jesus, not the fake kind of love, not people professing they love Jesus, but they truly love Jesus. A church where they truly care and love for souls. Newcomers, for people who come across the street, for the houses we knock on the doors, for our brothers and sisters in Christ in the room. We want to prove that we truly care and love them in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they can't find that kind of a love in a bar. They can't find that kind of love in God-forsaken schools that have forsaken the Lord. We want to show them the love of Jesus Christ that even churches are failing to do. Does that mean we're a perfect church? Absolutely not. Some of you have been here. Some of you have known me for years. You have seen people in church being human flesh. We are not perfect people. You're going to see me slip up. You're going to see Tom slip up. You're going to see Jack slip up. You're going to even see Chuck slip up. You'll see Chris slip up. No way. No, not you. No, you'd be surprised. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, the Bible says. We're all human flesh. But you know what we are? We are sinners, imperfect sinners, who want to do our best, who want to put in at least some kind of effort to pull some kind of effort to love Jesus Christ, to love others, to love lost souls, do what we can to create a Bible-believing church. I want to incite within you a passion, even if you don't have a church, for people watching us online who, d who don't have a Bible-believing church. For those of you out there who don't have a Bible-believing church, I want to incite within you a passion that all God needs is just one person to do the job. Do you know why? Because Jesus Christ even said, if you won't cry out, the rocks will cry out. God will use anyone. He can even use a dumb donkey, did he not? He used a dumb donkey to speak to the false prophet, Balaam. False prophet, false preacher. This guy who's supposed to talk to God and know everything. God taught a pastor, a prophet, a lesson through a dumb donkey. See, God can use you. I want to encourage you that God can use you. I don't know any Bible, Pastor. This is actually new to me. I've never been here before. Uh, what is it like to be a Christian? Don't worry about that. that. Those are the people God can use. Look, a rock doesn't have brains. You have a brain. If you have a brain, you can do more than a rock that God can use for His glory. God can use anyone for His glory. I want to encourage you. Let's pray. God, my Father... As I preach your word, fill within me the Holy Spirit power. Wash away my sins with your blood. God, help me to preach what you want me to preach. God, I am dust and ashes. I am human flesh. So please, dear Lord God, put aside Gene Kim and think more of your glory here, where you are magnified in this sermon, where these people can have a passion and a desire to serve you. God, I need the right words to say. And Heavenly Father, as we begin our service here, may it bring glory and honor to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 My first point is to not compromise. To not compromise. Look at Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. Why are Bible-believing churches so small, Pastor? Simple. We don't compromise. That's why. That's why. We can get bigger than this. We can get more money than this. We can get a better place than this. We can sure do that. We can sure do that. But here's the thing, is that when you stand for the truth and nothing but the truth, people will walk out in the middle of preaching. People will not want to hear the preacher. People will go to a different church that pleases their flesh because they say something what they want to hear. Look at Romans chapter 16. Look at verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren... Mark them which cause what? Divisions. divisions. 
Not unity. This is not getting along. God sees this as dividing, splitting. And offenses contrary to what? The doctrine which ye have learned. And what? Avoid them. Avoid them. You know what we are going to do as a Bible-believing church? As a Bible-believing church, it is absolutely important. Now, I want you to understand this. If you don't understand this part, you're going to walk out of this church. You're not going to like being in a Bible-believing church. Because here's the thing. There are many churches here. Why would I even bother starting one? You know why? why? Why bother starting one? Why not go to a place where there's absolutely no church around? Do you know why? Because of doctrine. Do you know what the purpose of the church is? To teach you the right thing. To make you believe in the right thing. To guide you in the right path. The truth. Now, here's the thing. An easy question. Don't you want to know the truth? And nothing but the truth? Aren't you sick and tired of lies and people telling you lies? Aren't you tired of churches where pastors will have to mask themselves concerning beliefs and doctrines so that they can maintain your membership, get, keep getting your money in the tithes and offerings? Aren't you sick and tired of that? That's the thing. You know how I can keep everybody here? Avoid certain beliefs and doctrines. Teach something where we can all find something to agree upon. And then the things that are like doctrine, brush them aside. Yeah. Brush them aside. Pastors are politicians, you got to understand. Amen. Pastors are politicians, you got to understand. Oh, how do I know you? How do I know you? Stick around and you'll find out. All right? Some of these people, they stuck around and they found out. Some of these people went to church to church to church and they found out. Don't believe a word that I'm saying. Stick around. And find out. You know what people want to do? They want to act judgmental on the very first impression. That's how people are. First impressions. I think Jesus Christ would be a poor example of that. Because Jesus Christ, what, what was the first word he said? The first word he said when he preached? Repent. What's the first impression when you hear somebody preach out repent on the streets? Crazy. One of those crazy guys I've seen on YouTube. One of those crazy guys that the liberal news media warned us about. See, don't judge by first impressions. Man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the what? The heart. The heart. So how can I judge the person rightly? You judge the person rightly by doctrine, not by first impression, not by first appearances, not how, oh, how, you know, how much bigger the building is and oh, how many more programs there are and how much nicer the people are. There might be days here where we love you in the Lord, but somebody might be so ignorant and negligent that they might not even shake your hand and say hi. I'm sorry. You might come across one of those days. I'm sorry, Brother Tom, that I didn't shake your hand and say hi. You're going to come across one of those days. One of those days, you know why? Because like I said, we're human flesh. We're human flesh. But you know what we are? At least we are sinners, human flesh, who are trying. Who want to try and serve God. And you know how we try and serve God? By doctrine. And trust me, a lot can be filtered out of the church 90% of the time due to doctrine. Doctrine. You know where I get people walking out and leaving more, more on? Not on the preaching, but on the teaching. On doctrine. Oh, you believe in that? You believe in that? No, I don't believe in that. I don't agree with that. The thing is, God says, mark them which cause what? Divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned. Some of you might ask, why is doctrine so important? Why do you have to know, oh, you have to know the truth and doctrine this, doctrine that? You know why doctrine is important? Why don't you listen to the doctrine of Adolf Hitler then? What he taught on. Doctrine simply means teaching. Doctrine simply means teaching, belief. Do you really believe that Different teachings are not a big deal. What about the doctrine of Adolf Hitler? No, the, the, no, no way. Why? See, ask yourself why. Why is he wrong? See, you, gotta, you don't use critical thinking. I thought that a lot of you attended public schools. I thought a lot of you went through college. Didn't they teach you to use critical thinking? We live in a machine world. We just go to church by tradition. See, the appearance, the people, the close friends we want to hang around with, etc. The gimmicks, the kind of programs. 
We go to job and follow along the system, machine. We go to school so that we can get good grades. We follow the system. We go to church and do whatever the pastor and the church says. Why? Because it's a machine. It's a system. We don't go by doctrine. Doctrine, you can tell what's right and what's wrong. How do you know what your teacher is saying in school is right or wrong? Are you just going to believe every word? How do you know what you're watching on the news is right or wrong? Everyone can agree that we don't agree with everything that the news media says. Even liberals say that. We can all agree with that. Do you know why? Because we have the common sense of doctrine, right belief, right teaching. You got to use judgment. You got to use discernment on what's right and what's wrong. And while you're hearing this preaching, you can't judge me by the tone of the voice, by, oh, he's not in a good mood today. He's, he was yelling at that sermon. Come on. Come on. What do you think Jesus' volume was when he preached on the Sermon on the Mount to yeah, 5,000 yeah, yeah, people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You think he got microphones that time? And he said, blessed are the yeah. poor in spirit, for <laughs> theirs is the kingdom of heaven. No, he had to go like, blessed are the poor. And he had to do that. He was preaching to 5,000 on top of the mountain. You got to realize this. You can't judge by that. You can't judge by the appearance, by the building, by the number of people, by the money, by the program. It's doctrine. Doctrine. You got to judge for yourself what's right and what's wrong. How do you know that I'm right? How do you know that I'm wrong? How many times have I told you, church, Don't believe a word that I'm saying. Don't you dare believe a word I'm saying. Look at the book. Look at the book. Do you know how you can judge how I'm right and wrong? Don't you have a book in your hand? Don't you have a book in your hand to judge and discern? Do you know how much of a world we live in where people, they just uh, don't read the Bible, but they go by this, this technology thing? Do you know how many people don't use a Bible and they have to use a big screen? So then they'll trust whatever so-and-so put on the screen? For all you know, I could be putting a fake Bible verse over there. For all you know, I could be quoting a fake Bible verse right there. You need to look it up for yourself and judge if the pastor is right or wrong by doctrine. By doctrine. You don't think it's important? You don't think it's important? When you raise kids one day, how are you going to persuade them that you're right? Kids, how do you know that your parents are right or wrong? Because you made up your own doctrine, see? You made up your own right kind of belief, right kind of teaching. See, everyone has that. Everyone has a judgment of doctrine, right belief, right teaching. So you got to understand this. If the church is teaching something different from the Bible, something wrong from the Bible, God says, mark them and what? Avoid them. Avoid them. That's why we're not a big church. You know why? We believe in standing for the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So we're going to teach the right doctrine. Well, that doctrine is not a big deal, or that doctrine is not a big deal. Isn't every doctrine from God's Word important? Isn't every doctrine from God's Word important? Who are we to judge for ourselves? Not that important, not that important. I believe every doctrine in the Word of God is important. Thus, we have to realize that there are things that we draw a line upon and say no. You know what we believe? We believe in the whole truth, nothing but the truth because of doctrine. So you're going to hear something that this preacher is going to say one day in teaching. Maybe right now you're like, this sounds good, this sounds good. But when I go to specific doctrines now, then your spirit's going to change. Your heart might change. You might go, well, I don't like that. I don't like that. How do you know? See, you can't, what, because you, it disagrees how you feel, what you personally believe, or by the word of God. Don't, I told you, don't believe what I'm saying, and don't disagree with what I'm saying either, until you look at the book, the book, the book. You know what I believe by the book? I believe that the King James Bible is the perf- 100% perfect word of God. I don't believe in other modern versions. 
That's doctrine. You know what I believe? I believe that the church will not go through the tribulation, that we will be raptured before the tribulation. That's doctrine. You know what I believe? I believe that there are passages that are for different time periods, different groups of people, and do not apply to the Christian church. That's doctrine. You know what I also believe? I also believe that the signs and healings and visions and speakings of tongues are not for the church. That was for a different dispensation to the Jews. That's doctrine. You know what I believe? I believe it doesn't matter that you, uh, you have to worship God on a Sabbath or a Sunday. We don't believe in that. Or in dietary laws. We don't believe in that. If you want to go by dietary laws, that's your conviction. But in the Word of God, what we believe in, it doesn't matter what you eat. Or concerning certain days you observe, it doesn't matter. That's doctrine. That's doctrine. You know what we believe in? We believe in preaching that convicts you of sin when even when you feel uncomfortable, even when it's unpopular. That's doctrine. This is doctrine, you got to understand. Doctrine. How did you feel so far after that? How did you feel so far after that? Whoa, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Good. Search the scriptures now and see. Why don't you come and ask me? I won't bite you. I won't bite you. I know I, know I could look a little uh, upset at the pulpit at times, but I don't bite you. I'm a really nice guy. And if you're, you're, if you're so scared of me, why don't you go to Brother Jack? Isn't he a nice guy? Why don't you go to Brother Chuck? Isn't he a nice guy? Look at Brother Tom. Doesn't he smile all the time? I know that Brother Stan looks intimidating, so don't go to him, all right? You can, you, you can go to Brother Emilio after that. Look at that, okay? We're, we're loving people. You know why? We were in your position before. That's why. Not only that, we were worse than you before we came here. We understand where you come from. We understand where you come from. Doctrine. Another thing is that we avoid the world. For time's sake, we won't turn there. But I'm going to give you the verse. Romans chapter 12, 1 through 2. The Bible says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know what we believe as a Bible-believing church? We believe in abstaining from the world. Now, some of you, okay, even millennials, okay, some of you millennials, okay, don't you get scared seeing what teenagers and 10-year-olds are dressing up like now? Yeah. Yeah. And those of you who are a little older than millennials, don't you get scared about how the millennials are dressing up right now? Yeah. And don't you grown adults get scared about how your kids are dressing up like when they turn into young adults? Yeah. And some of you older people who became grandparents now, don't you think that the whole world is pretty much shot by what they look like now? Yeah. You notice that, that the dress codes are getting worse and worse and worse. The thing is this. The people look at what they see on television. People like to show off the flesh so that people can, look, can keep looking at them. Some, some guys want to look like girls so that they can look cute. You know, we, they all want to be worldly minded. When you put on a garment, do you think, does this glorify God? Does this glorify Jesus Christ? Why do you wear a tie? Why do you wear a suit, Pastor? Because politicians, government officials, and even regular people who work at business companies, they take a high esteem in dressing right to represent their company, their, gum, their company, their president, their government. Why can't I do that for Jesus Christ who deserves the best? Who deserves the best of all best? That's why we believe in dressing right, in dressing appropriately. Sometimes now people just blush when there's a person who wears short shorts and sits right next to them in the pew and the preacher is talking about Jesus Christ at the same time. We live in that kind of a day and age. Now what kind of a church are we? We don't judge people easily when they walk in and they don't know this kind of stuff. We don't do that at all. We have people who just, I mean, uh, Brother Chris had a man bun, you know, that time. We didn't judge him. We didn't judge him. We, we just, uh, now Robert, he just keeps teasing him about it and won't leave him alone. Won't leave him alone now on that one. <laughs> and I just teased him now in front of thousands of people online now. See? The thing is this, see, is that, see, we don't judge people like that. We don't do that. 
So I don't want you to feel intimidated when you come here. Because the thing is, is that, like I told you before, we were once like you. Better than that, we were even worse than you when we came here. So here's the thing, is that we totally understand that. But see, at least we strive. And churches, they don't even strive. Pastors, they don't even strive. They don't even tell their members about this kind of stuff. They just tolerate and put up everything. No, we draw a line. We draw a line. This church will absolutely never be worldly. We don't have a drum set. You know why? We don't believe in the worldly music. We don't believe in the jazz. We don't believe in the pop. We don't believe in the rock. We don't believe in heavy metal. What's wrong with that kind of music, Pastor? Well, well, let me ask you this simple question. Have you ever listened to rap, heavy metal, pop, the kind of words that they put in there? Have you ever heard their kind of music that's filth with sexuality and violence? Or you just never paid attention to the song before and you just went by the beat? See, that's what music is. It's hypnotism. You don't even pay attention to the songs and what the words are representing. And you know what? Here's the thing. Why would Christians borrow and use that kind of music where they use to glorify sexuality, where they glorify violence, where they even put satanic, I'm not lying, satanic references in there. See, some of you are already saying, I don't believe it. Again, talk to me. Talk to these people. Search for yourselves. Why don't you take your favorite music and look at the lines next time? Why don't you pay attention to the background music, what they're doing now? Some of you don't because you're just hypnotized by the music. Some of you might say, well, you know, that's the lost people's music. If I put Christian words in there, Christian words really are good words. They're really good words. You're right. If I look at the words of Christian rock, Christian rap, Christian pop, Christian jazz, they are really great words that glorify God. But I never said music. It's words. It's words, not the music. You know what we're condemning? Not the words now. It's the music there. It's the music. The music that was intended for sexuality, for violence, and etc. That's why that, that's what that drum beat is. The percussion drum. That's what the electric guitar is. We don't believe in that. That's why we don't have that. We don't believe in that. We are not going to compromise with the world. Now do you see why we're small? Now do you see why other churches are growing bigger? Because they make the, you, you notice how churches stress a lot on music? Did you notice that? How much hours they spend time on setting up the system for music? How many hours they spend on what they call worship? You realize that? There's something here where the preaching of the word of God is de-emphasized. And where the music that lost musicians have used to glorify sin as a majority of the church hour, there's something seriously wrong. Don't you agree? We are not going to be a church that will compromise with the world. Absolutely not. That's why we started a church. Because we want, don't you want your kids to feel safe yes. and to see something safe with something holy and pure in the eyes of God? Yes. You know that the church will not do something sexual or violent or anything of the world that will, bat, that will wrongly influence them. Don't you want that kind of a church? Yes, We're going to create that kind of a church. Another church we're going to have is a soul winning type of church. Right. You've been to churches. How many of them have soul winning? How often do they do soul winning? Zero. Zero. Amen. How, I mean, here's the thing. We believe in street preaching. We believe in knocking on people's houses. And not only that, we believe in our everyday life. We're going to leave a track to somebody. We're going to tell our, tell our loved ones about Jesus Christ, how to get saved. We're going to do that. We're going to do that. We're not, you know, a lot of people always judge by what they see on TV. They think that soul winners, they think that street preaching is some crazy guys preaching on the street like a bomb saying, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going to hell. No, we're not that type of church. You know what those guys are? Those guys are full of the spirit of madness and hatred. And I don't care if they judge me by that. If they really cared, what was the point? Of preaching about hell what's the point of preaching about repentance you ever thought about that why did God mention hell and repentance you ever thought about that he mentioned he only mentioned it 
so that your sins can be repented of at the foot of the cross and that Jesus Christ can save your soul. How many of them have offered them the way to get saved? All they do is condemn and condemn and condemn and they never show them how to get saved. When I preach against sin, when I tell you to repent, and when I preach about hellfire, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make sure that leads you to the cross of Jesus Christ. Yeah. I'm going to make sure that leads you to salvation. I'm going to make sure that that for those of you who are already saved, if I preach against your sin, you might walk out mad, and I'm sorry about that, but I will not compromise in preaching against sin if it's going to lead you to a better relationship with Jesus Christ, and I will never say sorry to that. You know why? That's caring. That's loving. If I condemned you, I would name every sin in the book and just condemn you and not give you a solution and not give you a way to give you a better relationship with Jesus Christ and salvation through his son. I got better things to do with my life. You think I want to be here in this liberal area? You think I want to be here and then uh, just pastor a church and, you know, do what I can? You know how hard it is in standing for what's right? You already saw Right? You already saw in your life how hard it is to stand for what's right. Now, try to take it to the next level where you're leading a church, where you're pastoring a church. You think I want this stuff? You think I got better things to do. You think I like preaching like this to you? I got better things to do. I could do whatever I want on a Sunday. But you know why I do this? I do this because I care for the people's souls. And I especially care for people who don't even come back again. I care for those people. I care for those people who will even hate me and misunderstand me. And I will not quit preaching to you if that will save your soul, if that will give you a better relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's why I told you before, even if it's one or two and you've seen me doing that, I will stick right here because I care for people in this community and I care about you. I care about you. We believe in soul winning, in getting you saved. We believe in getting you saved. That's why you'll always hear me presenting the gospel at the end of the preaching. You'll see us knocking on doors and preaching out on the streets. You know why? We care for your soul. Amen. That's right. You know that caring for your soul is more important than feeding you, yep. than giving you money, than providing your financial needs, and giving you a new house in this expensive area. Some people think that you love them because you feed them food, because you give them money, etc. What kind of a blind world we live in? That's just temporary in the body. How is that going to last for eternity? Soul is eternal. Soul is eternal. That's why we prioritize in caring for you. If we care for you, we want you to get saved. Because your soul will burn forever in hell or live happily ever after in heaven with Jesus Christ. We believe in soul winning. You know what another thing we believe in? We believe in loving people. Who calls us a hate group? What in the world, man? What in the world? Do you know how many other religions you can pick on concerning hate groups? And they find some weird weirdo in no man's land, however they found that kind of a church, however they found that kind of person, and publicize it on the news. And people eat it up. What kind of a mad world we live in? They always pick on Christianity. You know why they have to find the little scraps, the little weirdos of Christianity to pick on? Because that's a hard religion to pick on. It's a religion that emphasizing loving other people. It's a religion where Jesus Christ said, love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you. Bless them that persecute you and despitefully use you. We believe in loving people. That's why I told you we don't judge people automatically when they come in. We don't believe in doing that. We believe... And brothers and sisters in Christ, I want to emphasize this. I want to emphasize that some of you may have a, you may be right with God, and your life may be right with God, but that can turn into pride, as our one brother said. It can turn into pride where we start picking on and nitpicking on other people's faults and flaws. And if you have that kind of a problem, you better repent, you better get right with God, because one day... God will point out your weakness and your flaw and somebody else will nitpick on you. And you're going to feel so guilty, you're not going to come back to church anymore. We don't believe in that kind of judgmental, nitpicky attitude. We don't believe in that. You better repent, get that right with God. 
Well, don't we have to draw a line, preacher? That's right. The preaching, of, don't you think the Word of God will do it? Don't you think the Word of God pierces and pricks through the heart and convicts their lies about serving Jesus Christ? Don't you believe in that? The Word of God will convict and preach at them. You got to love one another. You got to realize that you're no better than them, and that's the problem. Do you know why you act judgmental? You think you're better than them. Because you got all the doctrine straightened out. Your whole heart is right with Jesus Christ. But you know what Jesus Christ said about the Pharisees? Jesus said the Pharisees were the most, the best kind of people who kept the law. That's what he said at Matthew 5. The righteousness of the Pharisees must be exceeded in theirs, Jesus said. Because he realized they were the pinnacle and the height. But you know what Jesus Christ still did? He still preached and rebuked against the Pharisees. Do you know why? He called them hypocrites. You know why? Because they act all holy, they do holy things, but deep down inside your heart, you know what your weakness is, you know what your flaw is, you know what your sin is, and the reason why you can act holy and judge other people is your sin was not pointed out yet. You have that kind of an arrogant pride attitude, you better repent, get that right with God. And you call us a hate church after that? No, we get on people who don't love one another. Did you read the book of 1 John, how many times it says about love? Yeah. We believe in loving one another. If, do you love people? Keep in, what about the people who came in the first time? Make them feel welcome. Right. What about brothers and sisters in Christ who are somewhere around the corner that uh, are not able to get along with others? Pay attention to those people. Talk to them. It's very tempting that us Bible believers, I know we need fellowship. Some of us who can already get along with the people here. We want to spend time fellowshipping, talking with others. I get that. But look, it's not about yourself. It's about others. What you need to do is sacrifice your fellowship time, focus on other people who are not able to enjoy the fellowship, and you fellowship with them. That's what you need to do. You need to do that. You need to focus on other people and start fellowshipping with them. I know we're hungry for fellowship, but see, that's what love is. Love is complete selflessness and thinking about others. Yeah, amen. Love one another. And those of you who are not good at getting along people, you love other people too. You try speaking a few words. We're not going to think you're stupid and dumb and throw you out. All right? Put some effort. Talk to some people. Love one another. The church job is for everyone to love one another. Not selected elites here, okay? Not the pastor. The pastor can't shake the hand of, God forbid one day we have 1,000 people and I'm going to have to keep track of 1,000 people and make them feel welcome. I'm going to blow my brains out after that. You got to realize it's not about certain elites and certain higher spiritual people. It's you yourself. That's how we create a great church. When they see... All people, don't, when a person walks in and they see everybody, everybody loving one another. That's what they see as a loving church. If they see only a pastor and two or three people loving people, and the majority of them not doing their thing, what do they think about the church? It, regular church. Regular church. Love one another. Love one another. That's very important. Not only that. My last point is creating the best church. Creating the best church. You want to be in a church that's the best. You shouldn't be just content with what we have here. We, wanna, we want to create the best kind of church. That's what we're going to do. My vision will never die out until I reach every single person around the world. Well, that's quite a high vision that will never be attained. Well, I'll tell you one thing. Because I keep having that vision, I'm able to do more now than I did before. Some of you don't have a big vision. And because of that, you're still the same as you were five years ago. How long have you been in this church? Have you done much more improvement now? Or are you, were you the same like yesterday? Let's make it better. Let's make it better. That's why we pass out these sheets to encourage you. Let me sign in my name so I can help out with the nursery, so that I can help out with the song lean, so that I can help out with the teaching, so that I can help out in preparing the food, so that I can help out in even just attending. 
and being a blessing to other people. Come on, let's create the best kind of church. Don't you want this to be the best kind of church? Look, if you want a church with a lot of people, with a lot of people who love Jesus, with a lot of people who you can sense that they have a fire and a passion for Jesus Christ, a church that is abstaining from the world, a church that all have a desire to win souls, then you yourself need to put in some effort to do it so that we can create that kind of a church. Let's do it. Let's go to war. Let's go fishing. Let's go reach out the souls over there. Let's create this into a better church. Let's bring more people into this church. Let's bring more conviction on the altar. Let's go out soul winning. Let's go out street reaching. Let's go knock on doors and tell people about the love of Jesus Christ and that sin will take them to hell fire, but that the glory can take them to heaven. Let's tell them how to get saved in Jesus Christ. Let's create a church where the singing, you can sense the passion. You can sense the fire. People have a love for Jesus Christ. Don't create a dead singing atmosphere. Create a lively atmosphere. Don't create a dead prayer atmosphere. Let's create a lively prayer atmosphere. Don't create a dead preaching atmosphere. Let's make a lively preaching atmosphere. Don't create a dead soul winning atmosphere. Let's create a live soul winning atmosphere. Don't create a dead fellowship atmosphere. Let's create a living, living fellowship atmosphere. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it together. As soon as this preaching is over, boom. Let's get to work. Let's do it. Well, I'm by myself and I can't do something to serve God. My friend, one person will influence and shine the light and rub off on other people. And what's going to happen is that you'll become a magnet. And people will turn to you for spiritual help and advice. And you're going to be shocked and you're going to go, what, me? I'm a sinner. I don't know much Bible. Why would you come to me for spiritual advice, spiritual help, spiritual comfort? You know why? Because you at least put in the effort. They didn't. Put in the effort. Shed forth the love of the Lord Jesus Christ when they can see that. Let's create the best church. Let's bring more people here. Let's make a better singing atmosphere. Let's create a better prayer atmosphere. Let's, create, let's build up the souls to get saved. Build up the ties. Let's build up the attendance. Let's build up more laborers in here. Let's create the best church ever. Let's create the best church ever. And you know what? The Lord will bless and honor it. And you know what? Some of you who have been here for years, you've already seen how, much, how many fruits we brought to the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know why? People put in effort. People put in effort. Let's create the best kind of church. Those of you who are new over here, welcome to San Jose Bible Baptist Church. You came in at a good timing, actually. You came in at a timing. You came in at a timing where we're going to begin creating this kind of a church. Will we be perfect? No, we're not going to be perfect. Is everything going to go up, up, up? No, we're going to go through downhills. Is everyone here going to be loving and kind and nice? No, you might see a jerk somewhere. And he might be sitting next to you. That's a jerk. You might be sitting next to one. But you know what? You are at a church where there are, where there are people who are going to try. At least try and put in an effort. A lot of churches aren't doing that. Let's start something for Jesus Christ. Every head bow and every eye shut. The altar call is open. If the Lord led upon your heart... You can come here for it on the altar's floor. There's plenty of space, plenty of space, and you can pray to the Lord over here on the altar's floor. If some of you, if some of you are unfamiliar, we give you a time where you can pray in your seat or you can come forward here on the altar and pray to the Lord. Some of you can stand when you pray over here. Some of you can pray in your seat. Some of you can come on the altar's floor and kneel. It doesn't matter. But we give you this time to pray to the Lord where you can ponder some things on what you can get right with God. Let's create a greater church, shall we, together? Together, let's create a greater church together to glorify the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He deserves the best. We lack the facilities, Pastor. I'm telling you, man, Jesus used a dumb donkey. Why can't he use you? I know we don't have much. But we do have a big heart. Yes. And I'll tell you one thing. We do have a bigger heart compared to a lot of other churches. Am I saying this out of pride and arrogance? No. I'm saying this out of sadness. I wish there were more churches like that. If you don't believe me, stick around and find out. 
Stick around and find out. See if we're going to stand for it. See if we're going to teach it. See if we're going to practice it. We want to create a Bible-believing church that can reach the lost. Some of you, I would like to ask you a serious question because we are a church that believes in saving souls. We believe in that. So I'm going to ask you this question. If you were to die today, are you 100% sure you can go to heaven? Some of you might say, I'm not sure, Pastor. I'm not 100% sure I can go to heaven after I die. Okay. You can get saved right now in your seat. You might say, really? How, Pastor? Three simple points. That's it. Three simple points. Point number one, realize that you've sinned against God. Sinned against God. And you must understand that because of sin, sin will damn you to hell for eternity. So point number one, you must first understand you can't go to heaven because you've sinned against God. With every head bow and every eye shut, please, out of respect for the person next to you so that this can be totally private, so that the person doesn't feel scared or embarrassed. The first point is to understand because you sin, you can't go to heaven. You might say, well, how do I get rid of my sin, Pastor? Going to church can't save you. Getting baptized cannot save you. Doing good works cannot save you. Being religious cannot save you. Understand that. Good works cannot save you. You might say, well then, pastor, what can save me? The blood of Jesus. That's why Jesus died for you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected. So his blood can wash away your sin. Remember, your sin puts you to hell, right? And remember, only the blood of Jesus can wash away the sin. So all you have to do to get saved is to simply, point number three, just say to God, just say to God, God, I only believe in the blood of Jesus to get rid of my sin. I only believe in the blood of Jesus to take me to heaven. That's it. You're done. You might say, is it that simple? That's right. It's that simple. The Bible says the gift of God is eternal life. It's like a gift God has given to you. He made it that simple. You might say, well, pastor, I want to get saved right now, but I don't know how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, I can help you say it to God. I'll give you the words, and all you have to do is repeat after me. Now, remember this. Repeating after me will not save you. It's believing, believing in the blood. I'm only giving you the words on how to say it. That's all, okay? If you want to get saved right now, then please bow your head, close your eyes out of respect, and then you can repeat the words after me. You don't have to say it out loud. This is totally private. No one knows who you are. No one is looking around. This is totally private. You just repeat after me silently to yourself, okay? Repeat after me. Dear God, I repent as a sinner. I only believe in the blood of Jesus to save me. I believe Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. If you would just bow your head, close your eyes. One last time. One last time, 60 seconds, and we're done. Thank you so much for your patience. We're going to wrap it up right now. If you would just bow your head, close your eyes one last time out of respect so that this can be totally private so that you don't feel embarrassed. If any of you have repeated those words after me, could you just slip up your hand like real briefly, real quick. I'm not going to point out who you are. No one knows who you are. This is totally private. No one knows who you are. Could you just slip up your hand real quickly so that I can pray for God to bless you after the service is over? Could you slip up your hand right now? Right now, please slip up your hand real quickly right now. Okay, thank you so much for your honesty. We're going to close with a word of prayer. God, my Father, I want to thank you so much for the blood of Jesus Christ that can save souls. I pray, Heavenly Father, that today's preaching has been a blessing rather than a burden. You do know how much I love each and every person who came in, and I mean that. And I mean the, all the souls around the world as well. I pray that you'll bless this church, do something great. Bless the fellowship and the next Bible study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church, as the apocalypse is coming even closer, 
The point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone, without works, through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.